Hi, my name's Steve, and I'm on the team here at One Hope Baptist Church. Thanks for being here. I'm so glad you could join with us today to praise God and grow in our relationship with Him together. We're one church together wherever we are. I pray that you're able to engage in the worship this week and that the message encourages you and challenges you and is timely for you, wherever you might be facing in your life right now. I'm believing that God is going to speak right into your situation today. Amen. Come on, we sing this out together, church. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe in. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. 
great. Well, welcome to church. If I didn't introduce myself, my name's Jono. I'm part of the team here at One Hope. So glad uh, we can be uh, together this evening. Special welcome if you're checking out uh, One Hope and you're new. Um, scorecards are just out in the foyer, so you can um, grab them there. And also, too, welcome if you're um, connecting via uh, stream or on the podcast as well. We're so glad you can be part of church today. So... Hey, a little bit of a backstory. Um, at our church, we've got two campuses. Obviously, you're here, Barrable Hills Campus and Moolap Campus. At our Moolap congregation, we heard, all heard Andy Goulet last week, amazing message. But a couple of weeks prior to that, we've been doing a, a brief series called Better Than Normal. And so uh, we've really been enjoying that. And, and tonight, we're looking at um, better than normal intimacy. And so when we use that language, we've been talking about how the call to follow Jesus is one to live a different life. And uh, look, sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable and, uh, and, and completely different and countercultural. And so we've used this imagery of the beach. It should be a big picture of the beach pop up here. And we've talked about how, if you've ever experienced this, you get in the water at the beach, you're having a great time, there's people around you. And if you're not careful, like you remember when you were little and you're like, your point of reference was like mum and dad on the beach or the yellow umbrella or your stuff, like your towel and your, your keys. You'd stuffed your keys in the toe of your shoes thinking that no one would steal them, that kind of thing. But if you don't pay attention, what do you do? You, the water, the current, you drift and you end up somewhere that you never intended. And so we've been talking about how the same thing is true spiritually, where if we don't pay attention, if we're not on guard, actually the life of following Jesus is not one where we're meant to simply go with the flow and go with the current. And so we've been, uh, thanks Pastor Matt, um, we've been um, going through the book of Numbers and it's actually been really exciting and it's been good as we look at the lives of the Israelites and go, we can draw so much from their experience because their challenge is our challenge as well when it comes to following God wholeheartedly. And I made the comment a couple of weeks ago to our Moolap crew that, you know, if we face an opposition, I've experienced this in my life and maybe it rings true for you as well. If we face an opposition, which we do, to God's plan in our life, I don't believe that the opposition would set out to make me become or make you become really bad. Actually, it would be enough if we were just a little bit apathetic or a bit whingy and a bit whiny or maybe even if we just took God for granted. That would be more than enough. That would be more than enough for us to be caught in the drift and end up somewhere where God never intended us to be. Thankfully, the call to follow Jesus is way better than normal. Not, not freedom like relaxation, but freedom and a peace that can only come from us putting our faith in Jesus Christ and stepping into the plan that God has for our life. And so we see that demonstrated in the life of Jesus and we get to follow that. And as I said, sometimes it can mean embracing a level of discomfort. And today, we're gonna look at uh, better than normal, intimacy and sex. And so during the week, my wife Ellie asked me, hey, what are you talking about on Sunday? And I told her, and uh, quick, quickly, like almost too quickly, she said, oh, I've got some stuff that I reckon people will wanna know. And I'm like, I, I, I don't, like, you, no. And so I didn't ever find out, but... Um, her response made me really uneasy, and so if you would forgive me tonight, um, a different um, form of performance anxiety today. So just let's go with it, okay. Some of you right now, though, like you came in, like as soon as I said sex, you're just like, hey, we're a Baptist church. Like, you've break, broken a rule there, buddy. I'm like, which rule? And you're like, all of them. Like, we, we're not allowed to do that. That's actually a bit of truth to that. You know, there'd be some people here tonight, no doubt, that you would have, you would have grown up in a church or even if you didn't grow up in a church, maybe you've experienced a Christian where their tone was this. Sex is dirty. Sex is awful. Sex is disgusting. Save it for marriage. Okay? And this has actually been the prevailing experience for many, many people. But I would hope that we can have a bit of a, um, you know, maybe we can set about having that conversation in a better way because it'd be fair to say that we as a church haven't, haven't done as well as what we could have in that regard. Here's the truth. We shouldn't be uncomfortable to talk about what God was never uncomfortable to create. When it comes to sex, we should never be uncomfortable about talking about it in the right way and the proper way, because God was never uncomfortable to create it. Hey, question for you. How would you describe our culture's attitude towards sex right now? Take a moment just in your head. How would you describe our culture's attitude towards sex? I was reading one author and they said, look, nothing's more normal than sex, right? Premarital sex, extramarital sex, friends with benefit sex, 
porn, experimentation, casual hookups, whatever feels good between consenting adults. It's totally normal. Hey, look, maybe our parents were uptight and repressed about sex, but we're more progressive. We're liberated. You know, this is pointing in the direction, isn't it, that if boiled down, our, our culture and our society's view of sex would be to say, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt someone. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt someone. And, and where I think we've fallen over, maybe as followers of Jesus, is that we've done some pretty ordinary things, which, which includes that at times we've, pres- we've pretended that that culture doesn't even exist. It's just been too hard, fingers in the ears, like, no, nah, we're not even going to go there. I think even worse than that is that at times we've just tried to hide away. So we've seen it and then we've gone, actually, we're, we're going we're to burrow away and we're not even going to go anywhere near it. And I think even worst of all is at times what we've done is we've pointed the finger and we've just condemned people and we haven't moved towards them. Remember last week Andy said, like, we we can hold up the truth of what a, a life following Jesus looks like, but it should never be pointing the finger. It's actually moving towards people in love. And I think we can take some ground back for the kingdom here. Wouldn't we want to do that? That we can offer an alternative we can offer an alternative. We can, we can, fight. We can present something better than that. And here's a, here's a passage from Numbers that we've been looking at, and it's from Numbers 25, 1 to 3. Excuse me. I was going to say, while I'm getting a drink, you can look it up in your Bible, but no one's got hard copy, right? Just me. Hands up if you've got a hard copy Bible. Good. Good thing it's on the screen. All right. Numbers 25, one to three. While the Israelites were camped at Acacia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshiped the gods of Moab. And in this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against his people. There's a really strong pattern going on here in Numbers. If you wanna read it for yourself, it's one of the early books of the Bible. And the pattern is this. God has demonstrated his love for people. The people go and do their own thing and God gets upset. But what's going on? Like, why why is God angry about that? If God created sex for pleasure, why is God seemingly so obsessed when they actually go and have sex? Because what is actually going on at the core of the matter is that God always wanted his people. He wanted them to be led by him and respond to his voice and be cared by him. God was calling his people to be different. And the call is exactly the same for you and I. Because sex wasn't the issue. Sex wasn't the issue at all. That was merely the physical outworking of what was in their hearts. Because by itself, sex can be honorable to God and great and wonderful, but at the same time, like stewarded in the the wrong way, sex can lead to a drift. Intimacy can see people, us, end up in deep water it can be the very thing that draws us away from wholehearted devotion to Jesus. And you might have noticed the little word there, if we can flick it back up, it's, it, the word there is used is defiled. They defile themselves. You'll never guess at what's that, what that means. The word defiled in that sense means something that is moved from sacred use into the realm of the common. Really simply, God was upset because they took something sacred and they made it common. To use our language, normal, better than normal. I reckon many of us would have experienced an attitude in church circles where if you were to ask Christians, who, well, who gets swept away by the current? Who gets swept away? Who gets caught up in um, sex in the wrong way and you, not using intimacy the right way? Who would that be? And the answer would have been bad people. Bad people get caught up in the current. I think it'd be fair for us to say, we would say, no, no. People get caught up in the current. We get caught up in the current. Who's vulnerable to the drift? Each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. I was reading a story during the week of a tourist in Crete and uh, they got their Lila, you know the pump up air mattress things, like the little ones that you take to the beach and so they got theirs and pumped it up and uh, look, went down to the ocean, got in, closed their eyes and sometime later looked up and couldn't see the shore. 
Now their family knew that, that they had gone down to the beach but couldn't find their, their family member anywhere. And so after a long afternoon of getting roasted by the sun, the evening came and night came and then freezing cold, they clung onto their lilo in the middle of the ocean. And so the next day they wake up and, you know, oh, trying to find hope in, in anything, uh, there were some birds circling around. And so they started talking and singing to the birds until in one moment they had this horrible realisation like, oh no, what if one of those birds lands on my lilo and pops it? And singing stopped immediately, like, wouldn't it? Like, no, we are not singing anymore. You start praying that the bird isn't gonna land on your lilo. 21 hours after hopping into the ocean and suffering both hypothermia and sunburn, they were rescued 11 kilometers off the shore. 11 kilometers out to sea in a shipping lane. My point is this, listening and going along with the social norms and cultural expectations that surround us is the spiritual equivalent of getting out your lilo, pumping it up, hopping in the ocean, and just going, wherever the current takes me is fine. There's some issues with that thinking because we're just gonna go wherever the current takes us. It's a really interesting question, where does this, where does this anything goes current take us? Where do we end up? I was um, reading a book and it, it talked about university and uh, college culture, like co- particularly college culture in the US and it held up college life as the cutting edge of, uh, of our society, a kind of um, melting pot of like intellectual minds and thinking and also progressive thought, um, particularly around um, sex and sexuality. And uh, professor and researcher Donna Freitas, who specializes in the areas of social media, sex and sexual assault, uh, wrote a book on her findings of her research where she um, talked to thousands of college students across many universities. And she shared the results of her project uh, to what she refers to as hookup culture. Hookup culture, essentially the term that she uses to describe uh, like a, a relationship purely based on physical transaction. Sexual relationship with no expectation of intimacy or ongoing relationships or even without any boundaries. It's kind of like a anything is permissible and everything is good kind of attitude. She found that what this lifestyle promised and what it delivered didn't match up. And she says, in the classroom, students are perfectly capable of assessing and evaluating ideas. Meanwhile, they let their lives go unexamined. They not only allow others to devalue them, body and soul, but they do the same to others and to themselves. She went on, you must, you must however, smile in public about it, even if what you are doing is emptying you out emotionally. We don't have it on the screen, but she finally went on to say, most common among all the respondents were the 41% of students who expressed sadness and despair about hooking up. 41% expressed sadness and despair about the culture that they were part of. Why the sadness? Why, why the despair? Like if that culture is promising you everything, but clearly we see a gap between what is being sold and what is being experienced. She goes on to talk about the uh, students who experience loss and just the grief of shallow experiences and unmet expectations. And essentially, the findings were that people wanted something more. People wanted something deeper and more intimate. 41%, that's such a telling statistic because if a business claimed that their service would leave a person feeling fulfilled and four out of every 10 customers came back saying that they felt sad and despaired, at the very least, at the very least, that would be reason to pause and to consider and ask, is this really the best way? Is this really delivering on all it's promised? She finally went on to say, I found that both women and men were sad about the sex they were having. They wished for long-term relationships, dating, love, and romance, and felt their sex lives were pretty unfulfilling, even bad and embarrassing. How's this? Within hookup culture, it seems like no one is ultimately winning. Normal isn't working. And here, in the midst of this culture, God calls us and beckons us to express our sexuality in a way that is completely different 
completely different, but even at the same time, there's some things that we would agree on. Because as Christians, we would, we would agree with culture that says yes, a big yes, to the fact that our bodies are given to us for joy and satisfaction and pleasure. But here, there's a, a difference where a difference lies, we would say, but not only for those things. Not only for those things. And going back a step, like when we read about the Israelites, even going way back then, thousands of years ago, the relationships that they had were always intended to reflect something about God, to show something about God's character to the world around them. God's getting all fired up because he had demonstrated his love and power to these people, and they had heard the call to live differently, but they persisted in living just like everyone else around them. And we could, brush, we could brush through it, and they lived in a way where they just went, it, is so, it, is so, it seems so insignificant. And God was saying, it might seem insignificant, but it's really important. And they began to understand that a, that a small change, a slight drift from God often leads to big consequences. Put your hands up. Who's seen pictures of the Ever Given this week in the Suez Canal? Hands up. 400 meter long boat, like we, we, we get it, like a tiny little drift and suddenly like, man, big consequences. The challenge for the Israelites is the same challenge for us, it's to listen to the call of God to live a life that is holy. When I say holy, that means a, a life that pleases God rather than simply turn to the cultural voices that we experience that oftentimes reaffirm and validate our own conclusions and particularly our own behavior. Take pornography. P pornography, like God already knows naked and sex, okay? Like if you open the Bible, that's one of the first things that you read about. Like this is no surprise to God, but so why is pornography such a big deal? One thing about pornography is that it holds the power to change it, people's expectations and experience regarding sex based on people expecting uh, others to perform in a way that, pro that brings them pleasure, um, not realizing that often what they are asking is um, demoralizing or degrading or un uh, unpleasant to that other person. And in doing so, people aren't treated with value, they're treated as objects. As one writer put it, the real problem of porn is not that it shows too much, but because it shows too little. We can, we, we can see what's happening there. Like, yes, the physical remains, but everything spiritual and emotional is ripped out, and so what is left? Like, purely a transactional experience. And our culture in that way, like, look around. Like, people will just openly say, like, porn is fine. Like, so many people go, oh, like, that, no, that's fine. And in doing so, they're holding up and saying, actually, people, people, it's okay to treat people as if they're worth less than what they really are. It's okay to do that. And that's the difference. The difference of the gospel is that Jesus would give his life, including us, for, for us, because actually we're worth more than we would ever realize. Why is a core um, value of the Christian faith that, uh, you know, that the fullest and most God honoring way of um, expression of sex is within a marriage? Why is that? Because, because it was never intended that marriage would just be like, a, like a, a piece of paper and a stamp, the thing. It was always intended that a healthy marriage and the sex within it would reflect something about God. It would, it would, it's the commitment to the health and the self, the safety and the well-being completely of someone else. Simply put, sexual intimacy within marriage reflects the sold-out devotion of God to humanity. It, sex is a gift from God. It's meant to nurture intimacy and forge like a bonding of souls. So what can we do? What can we do? I think really, really simply, like you're doing a good thing tonight. We're doing a good thing. Like we're leaning into scripture. We are, you know, th there's always the opportunity for us to listen to wise Christian counsel, the people around us. That we'd also in our hearts say, God, I'm willing to hear from you we'd allow ourselves to be challenged rather than just have our, maybe our convictions reaffirmed by those we know that agree to us.
And so just in the few minutes that I've got left, I'd like to share with you two, I think, amazing things that God does uh, for our sexuality and also share with you one thing that he asks for us. So three really simple things, if you're taking notes on your phone, two amazing things that God offers us and one thing that he asks for, from us. Number one, there is freedom for those that have been held captive. If you feel captive right now in regard to sex and your sexuality or intimacy and how that is expressed, there is hope. There is hope. Through Jesus, we're offered a new life. And I would say to you tonight, if you feel captive, there's no better time to begin dealing with the shackles that you feel have kept you wrapped up. Today, you can, you know, you can begin to metaphorically like leave the chains behind, chains behind and unlock them. For some of you, for some of you, even as I'm speaking, you would go, I, I know what is... I know what the chains are. For some of you, it would be the conversations that you're part of. Maybe for some of you, it's the people that you hang out with and, and they're the drift. Like you, you're just in the drift together and you know that you're held captive by that. You can't get out. Maybe for some of you, what holds you captive is your experience and previous choices and decisions. For some of you, that was of your own choosing and heartbreakingly, for some of you, that would be not of your own choice. But God is committed to reaching to the very deepest part of our hearts, the very deepest part of our souls and our lives, and is committed to restoring it. For some of you, you would say, that's the images that you look up have just got you in chains. The images you look at, the people that you follow on your phone or the the accounts that you subscribe to, you, you know what it is. I would just say this. God is glorified when you respond to his words. So often we feel like if we... We can feel like if we're going to acknowledge that we need help or that we're in chains or in some way we feel broken, we just feel less than. And that's a great lie of the enemy because it keeps us in this position where we're locked and not really wanting to step out and deal with what is holding us captive. God is actually worshipped and honoured in the struggle when we say that we need help, that when we need him, we need his power in our life. You can come boldly before, if you've got a relationship with Jesus, you can boldly become, come before God and just say, my guilt and my shame have been placed on Jesus. There's absolutely nothing stopping me from coming to you and saying, God, would you begin to heal me? And it might be a long journey, but gee, it's a journey worth starting. And I would just think, you know, I was actually thinking about this. I heard this guy who was a music, he's a musician, and he talked about how from an, a young age, he would really good at guitar and he would play like in gigs and pubs and stuff like that. But he first of all got his chance to play guitar when he was in church. And he was talking about the contrast between doing gigs and playing in church on a Sunday. And he made this throwaway line and he just said, do you know what? Church is always the more forgiving crowd. You know, I'm like... Actually, I knew what it, like we know what he was meaning. Like you go to a gig and you've paid your cash, you hand over your cash and you're like, this is what I expect. But at church, I'm like, and I, I thought about this and I just thought, you know what? We want to be the forgiving crowd for people in chains, don't we? Like if you come here, you've got your home ground advantage. Like if, you, if, if nowhere else in your life you can trust that people are gonna, gonna support you and, and cheer you on, actually you can, you can come here. We want to be that kind of people, Right? We want to be that kind of people. Number two, really briefly, there is healing for those who are hurting. So many carry the emotional scars of experiences and choices and the values that we've chosen to express our sexuality and the consequences of it. You know, you can, you can be part of God's story of healing. I was thinking about a couple that, um, not here at this church, but uh, they had they had kind of two things happening at the same time where they, were, they found out they were pregnant and also they'd begun to explore the Christian faith at the same time. And in doing so, when learning that they were pregnant, and they, they hadn't grown up in a Christian context at all. They, they were surrounded by non-Christians. They hardly had known a Christian until they stepped into church. And anyway, they, they terminated their pregnancy. And at the same time, they come along to church and something is happening where they've got this growing sense of sadness until that sadness got to a point where it was just tremendous grief. 
And they couldn't work out what was going on until one day they, they came into church and they, um, it just so happened that one of the Bible readings was, was from Psalm 139. And you might have heard these words before. The, the psalmist or the songwriter is talking about um, how God, uh, our worth. And it says, the writer says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together even while I was in my mother's womb. Your work is marvellous. You saw me before I was even born. And so in that moment, this couple that were exploring the Christian faith, it, it's like it was just illuminated for them. It, it was illuminated, the fact that they were, they were experiencing a tremendous grief because they had lost a child. And they came, in their own words, they came to experience that they not only lost a child, they were grieving the loss of a child, they were realising that they had grieved God. Because in hearing those words and learning more, they just, they came to understand of like, it's so countercultural. they stepped in and they realised that God knows us before we're even born. That there's a sanctity and a value of life that God is knitting us together. Before anyone even knows you're pregnant, that actually God, God is doing something incredible. It's not by mistake. And so the very kind of the same place where they were able to deal with their guilt was the same place that they were able to experience peace and freedom as they found forgiveness in God. I've got to remember, and maybe it might be helpful for you tonight too, that we're going to step out of this church and we're going to, we're going to go about our week and we're going to rub shoulders with people that don't know the truth and the beauty and the relevance of the healing power of Jesus Christ. Particularly in regard to their sexuality and the fruits of it. This is such, such great news that God came to heal us, to change the way we think and place deliberate safeguards around us in the way that we live. Finally, what does God ask of us? Ask of us? It's a call to obedience. God is always leading his people to look and behave and pursue something others won't. I was thinking about this with my, what, who came to mind as I was preparing this message. It's actually a bunch of, bunch of people that I know, friends, um, part of the church who are, who are single, way, have been single way longer than they ever imagined or anticipated for. And these, are, these Christian friends have had opportunity to pursue relationships, whatever expression that took, from like kind of casual hookup to full-blown committed relationship, but they've found themselves constantly saying no and saying no because the people that were pursuing them or the opportunities that presented themselves weren't people that followed Jesus as passionately as, was, as, passionately as what they do. I can only imagine what their life is like, feeling like it's constantly a no. While their loneliness grows and they, you know, the, the I was just really inspired when I thought about it. The fact that, you know, giving their lives in an act of obedience to God. Like if, if the drift of our culture just says, just go and do whatever you want, like just, just do it, like hook up with someone or just have any relationship and here they are going, I, I, I'm not gonna go with that drift. I'm not gonna go with that drift. Jesus has set me free and I'm gonna be obedient to him as, as hard and as challenging as it is. Let me put it this way, right? Sometimes um, someone will uh, say to me like, um, Jono, like you, do you know how many songs we had this morning? Like, how many songs did we sing today at church? I'm like, uh, four. And they're like, yeah. Do you, know, do you know how many, like, do you know how many that was? And they're like, no, I don't know. Like, four too many. Four too many, Jono. And then someone else will come to me and they're like, hey, Jono, um, how many songs did we sing at church today? I'm like, I just had that combo over here. Like, what are we doing here? No, no, how many? We had four songs. Yeah, that's right. Do you know how many that is, Jono? I'm like, no, let me guess. I'm like, no. It's 10 too few. We should be having 14 songs. Jono, you know what? You know that bit where you get up the front and you talk for kind of 25 minutes or half an hour? You know what we could do? If you didn't do that, we could fit more songs in. I was like, I see what you're doing there. I see what you're doing there. You know what I thought about? Many of us would measure our worship in minutes and songs and hours. And what I found so inspiring when I thought about my friends that are live, living boldly in their singleness, 
counterculturally is there when they go home and they sit alone and eat their dinner and whatever's on the screen and whatever they're doing and in their heart they would love for nothing more than to have someone sitting beside them at the same time in the in the midst of their loneliness they're saying a big yes to God through their obedience when they go to a wedding and everyone's in couples and then they just get put on the random leftover singles table and they look around like, I don't know anyone again. Actually, in the midst of that kind of disgust and confusion, they're saying a big yes to God in their obedience. And the more I consider their lives, I'm just like, man, I, I, God, I wanna be like that. Like that's obedience. Like that's living a, a life in relationship with Jesus. I was so encouraged. Like, I think we should feel really privileged that we're part of a church where there's people like that inspiring us in our faith. That we can look around to each other and go, I want to follow Jesus as passionately as that. If everyone else is going to choose normal, actually, I'm going to go for better than normal. I'm going to invite the team, music team to come up. In a, in a moment, we're going to share in communion together. And communion is this amazing reminder to us that we are sacred, that we're bought at a cost, and that we're valuable. It's also the reminder that we can thank God that there's such a thing as better than normal. We can thank God that there's better than normal when it comes to sex and it comes to intimacy. I'm going to invite us to stand. Why don't we all stand together? I'm going to invite you. Let's just take a moment. Could you, could you just um, close your eyes for a moment? And as we prepare for communion, why don't we let that be our declaration today? And why don't we let, why don't we let sharing in communion together reflect that, you know, we remember that Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, would forgo his own desires to the point of laying, giving his life for us. And so, in the, in the same way, empowered by the same Holy Spirit, we, in return, can lay down our lives for him. That he would be glorified, not just in this moment, but in our entire lives. I'm going to pray and... I'm not going to ask anything of you this evening, but maybe if you, if you, if maybe you just say a big yes in your heart to what I pray, and then you come and grab the communion elements after the service. There's going to be opportunity to pray with people if you would like. But today's a great day to start and say to God, honestly, God, I've been settling for normal. God, I'm, today I'm choosing better than normal when it comes to sex. When it comes to intimacy, God, I'm choosing better than normal. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you so much that these things are your idea. God, we want to ask for your forgiveness because through our rebellion and our attitudes, we have fractured your good design and your best design for sex in our lives. But we thank you tonight, God, through Jesus, you reconciled us back to yourself. You reconciled us, you made us, you made that relationship workable again all because of your grace, all because of your decision, that through your life, Jesus, your death and your resurrection. We want everything to come under your Lordship, God. We open up the, open up the covers and say, God, just come and have your way. We want to start today. God, come and set us free. God, we ask that you would come and heal us and help us be obedient to you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you come up and uh, take communion in your own time and then we're going to sing together some amazing words and we'd maybe let that be your declaration tonight.
church to sing this out. My chains are gone, I've been set free. I've got my Savior, His presence. Thanks for joining with us today. If today's message has prompted you to take that next step in your relationship with Jesus, we'd love to hear from you and walk beside you in that. You can contact us through our social media or at onehope.org.au. Just click on the link tree tab to find our online connect card. Or if you're able to join us in person at any of the three Sunday services, we'd love to see you face to face. Have a great week.